Great. All right, Travis, Thanks, take it away. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, as Aaron mentioned, uh, I am with Place Taylor. We're a design build development company <clears throat> located in Roxbury. Uh, I'm the director of innovative design, also the in-house Pacifos consultant and a newly uh, elected board member to the studio. Uh, today we're being joined by Andres Bernal, a coworker and colleague of mine at Place Taylor. The, he's the director of architecture, uh, hails from MIT and worked at various firms uh, throughout Boston, uh, including Rody. Uh, and joined us about three years ago to kind of help launch our fully merged uh, architecture team at Place Taylor, um, and is actually one of the project leads uh, for this heavy heavy timber project that we're involved with. And then also Patrick Larkham uh, from Hacon, who's the project manager there. Uh, he joined the team of H with Hacon about 2020. Uh, his experiences in mechanical engineering as well as uh, business management. Uh, so he has a diverse background that he brings to HACON uh, with experience in the aircraft industry as well as the Department of Defense. Uh, and now is leading their CLT project, um, which has broken ground, which is amazing uh, in Boston too. So I just wanted to give everybody a little brief intro as to what CLT is in case there's any newcomers um and don't really haven't really seen it much anymore hopefully i can get my slide to advance here there we go so what is clt well it's cross laminated timber uh, it was developed in europe in the in the early 1990s um, and really didn't uh start kind of making world acceptance or or, or reaching a world sphere until about the 20 2010 or so uh, and that's when we started seeing more and more projects emerge more manufacturing start up uh, the great thing about CLT is it uses uh, uh, mostly like low growth forests. So the, the trees actually don't have to age uh, in, as far as their growth is concerned quite as long uh, as typical lumber would normally have to because it's finger joint and pine for the most part and it's laminated one over the other uh, in, a, in a cross laminated much like plywood. Uh, and those are usually done in plies, similar to plywood. So you can have three ply, five ply, nine ply CLT, and that's depending on the use. So it's either structural, non-structural, uh, it's really beautiful. So a lot of people like to try to keep it exposed and sort of bring back that sort of old mill sort of industrial heritage that we're so used to in New England, uh, which is why it's a great product for here. Uh, some key benefits, uh, it has really good uh, thermal performance. Uh, so in energy modeling, you kind of gain a leg up because it does have an R value associated with it. This also helps reduce thermal bridging. So when you do a continuous insulation on the exterior, typically you don't need quite as much um, to get that thermal bridge reduction. Uh, and it's actually really great for air sealing because you're just taping all the joints and applying a membrane to a solid surface on the outside. Uh, one of the big, big factors to it is reduced uh, body carbon content. So when we look at uh, full LCA analysis with CLT, we actually look at uh, more of a dynamic LCA. So we're actually looking at how uh, the carbon can be captured uh, before it's even uh, brought to factory. So prior to this A1, we're actually looking for when the tree grows. So it's actually pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, that carbon gets captured in the project, in the product, and then it goes through your kind of typical uh, standard cradle to gate concept. Um, and we're actually helping reduce embodied carbon overall. So we're excited to see that we can have projects that could be zero carbon embodied carbon up front from the start by integrating a lot more heavy timber uh, throughout the projects. Um, today, We'll have Andres talking about uh, a multifamily project that's all CLT, including uh, all the cores and shear walls. Patrick's projects get a little bit different, uh, where it's more of a hybrid style, but both have their own benefits and hurdles and uh, everything that's difficult to do. Uh, so you can see that it's really growing across the country. Uh, this is a little map from 2020, actually. Uh, and you can see how projects are really starting to launch and, and slowly grow 
um, across the nation. So here we are in Little Massachusetts. We've got a few here and we've got a few more coming. So I am going to stop the share and hand it over to Andres and he can take it away. All right. Well, thank you, Travis. Can everyone hear me? Thumbs up. All right. Thank you. Okay. Let me start. Um, I need to share. Do I need to be given uh, access to share? Uh, you should be able to. Oh, yep. Yeah. I see it now. Okay. Thank you. All right. Oh, that's got the wrong date. <laughs> um, well, um, hi, everybody. Uh, I think um, Travis already uh, sort of um, did a, a quick introduction to me, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be talking about what um, model C, what we're calling Model C. It's a, a project at 201 Hendon Street. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's it's probably the presentation is going to be more about kind of the journey that we've been going through. Uh, as you can see here, it's we by no means feel like a like a specialist yet, or, or like someone that knows a heck of a lot about CLT. We're just we, we're working through it and figuring things out as we go. So I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of a sort of introduction and history to the project. Well, introduction to Play Stellar. It's a little bit of uh, history of the project and then talk about uh, the, the things that we've been doing to, uh, with the project. Um, well, I think I can probably move through these slides already, but you know, we are Play Stiller, we're an ur urban design uh, build construct uh, company. Uh, and we're sort of focused from very early on in with, uh, you know, as a company that would be sort of pushing the envelope uh, in terms of, of carbon. We've also been um, uh, we've been submitting to the 2030, AIA 2030, and we're amongst this you know a group of about 15 or 16 firms that have been able to meet those goals. So so we're really proud of that, and we're, we're hoping that you know 201 Hamden is going to be, of course, one of the, the uh, one other project that is going to be within sort of this realm. All right. So let's just go to um, to the meat of, of of the project. Yeah, this is 201. It's this is the site right now. It's 201 Hamden. It's uh, uh, close to Dudley Dudley Square. Um, you know, or actually Nubian Square. Um, so so it's a pretty pretty. It's a tight site. Um, it has a, a lot of um, you know a lot of constraints in terms of. Um, you know, um, being adjacent to a park, just not, uh, being a, an infield site. So there's not a lot of uh, space for, lay, you know, laid down space or for construction and things like that. So, you know, right from the get go, it present, presents a number of challenges and actually I'm gonna go back up and, and it's a triangle too. So um, that, that, that was sort of another, another challenge from the beginning. Um, just going through here, just, giving you a little bit of a background. So um, right here, you can see in the sort of maybe right in the middle of the dark, that's that's the side. And what do you see the T roughly is sort of like Nubian, Nubian square. So it's, so it's about 10 minutes from, from the sort of the, the, the center there. It's, uh, you know, besides, you know, everything that we're going to talk about, it, it's also kind of has a pretty good sort of uh, walking score and, and it's in a good location. Uh, which also helped us sort of think about not having uh, parking for the, um, you know for this uh, for this building. So um, you know that that that's another piece from the early beginnings, even before we started thinking about CLT that we were trying to achieve with the building. It, it's uh, it, its context is it, it varied. It has a, a little bit of, of brick, sort of three four story buildings, kind of you know. Um, almost a feel of commercial, kind of like a downtown, but it's also kind of at the line of a very, uh, very residential neighborhood. Um, and when I say that, I mean more like clapboards and, you know, something that would 
be feel more residential, as you can see in this image. So, so from the beginning, as we started the design process, we were sort of like seeing that this building was sort of in between these two, and we were trying to. We thought that that would be sort of a a good uh, concept, at least for the design, as we started uh, thinking about how to how to you know um, just create the architecture around it. So you you can see here. Uh, some of the very early diagrams where, where we we had sort of we're looking at the industrial side of Roxbury and the re residential, we felt that we were right in the middle and we we're trying to sort of merge those two. And that you can see how some of the sort of peak roofs and sawtooth for l later on started to develop. And then we were right next to a park and that, that, that was really, that was also a big part of it. So Okay. So we we started the design just mostly as a call it a, as a what we call a um, model A or B for for place tailors. So so of course passive house, uh, and we were looking uh, at sort of prefabrication options, um, and uh, we had been working with Benson Wood. So that that's that's how we had started, but. We we sort of took a new approach and we started to talking to folks that have been looking into CLT and we started started talking to the uh, to generate. Uh, it's, uh, it's with, now it's a company. Uh, when we started talking to them, it was a lab out of MIT focusing on CLT and, and trying to sort of help um, the technology sort of uh, take hold in in Boston or in the Northeast. So, so they have done the research. They had sort of talked to some folks that have already built it. So, so they uh, they approached us and and sort of suggested, well, why don't you guys try it out? And of course, uh, you know, for us, uh, um, you know, sort of being kind of an R and D shop, we said, well, let, why not? Let's try it. Um, you know, it, it took some convincing. Uh, I, I was part of the ones that he, folks that needed to be convinced, <laughs> but um, so but but we we got there and, and we got there for for uh, for mostly because you know I think this slide is a, it's a good one. Sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing my slides here. Uh, but um, and I, I think Travis would be better at describing this slide, but but uh, it's you know if you if you look at the sort of the, the typical construction types, and we look at um, you know the, the global warming potential for mass timber, you know you, you can see the graph very you know clearly that that you know, a full CLT building um, you know just offers you know it, it just it does a lot better than all the other building types. Um, so this was uh, kind of this was very interesting to us, um, and uh, um, and in particular the idea of of pushing pushing all the way and trying to make it um, you know, a full CLT building. Uh, now, when I say full full CLT, I mean that the cores would be um, out of CLT, and so elevator core and, and stair cores would be CLT. Um, and also the shear, shear, all the shear walls, which means that we would just be talking about having a concrete slab and everything from there up would be CLT. So, so we jumped into, into it. I, I think this is another slide, I think better explained by, by Travis, but, but this is sort of part of it. It's just what, what, how can we sort of move forward in the embodied carbon? And of course you can see the CLT uh, I'm trying to move here. Yes, you see the, the mass timber just be, being these very thin lines, and if you compare them to, um, yes, just uh, all the um, board insulation and other building materials, just kind of having a, a lot more of an impact uh, in terms of uh, the embodied carbon. So we went for it. And, and uh, this is a quick gift that is uh, a lot of fun, but th this is sort of what, what, what the building's trying to do. You, you see really the key and maybe the main difference that, that, that this building's doing is that it's here at the stair course and the elevator core. Um, 
just to give you a quick de description of the building as this sort of goes up and down, it, it's, uh, it's a five-story building uh, with uh, an office uh, on the ground floor. And then from the second floor and up, we have, we have uh, condominiums. And uh, on the fourth and fifth floor, we have duplex units um, that uh, have really uh, beautiful, hopefully beautiful decks uh, that overlook the city and the neighborhood. So, oh, well, this is it. This is this is this is essentially what we have for the building. It's a small building. It's it's barely to, you know twenty thousand square feet, but we figured that that was a good way to start, especially when we were trying to push the limits. Um, and um, um, yeah, I, I think that's uh, you know th this is one of the renderings as your like Camden Street. It's sort of it, it's down here to the right. Um, we have the park, it's here to the left, uh, and if you can kind of go down Hamden Street, you can essentially end up at ISD, um, Boston ISD. Um, let me just go real quickly through the plan so you can get situated uh, and understand the building a little bit better. So Hamden Street is at the bottom. You, so you, this, you, the main entry is right of Hamden Street. You have uh, Sort of a, a co-working space that we're also hoping that it's an affordable co-working space uh, with the storefronts um, then we have an elevator feeding all the residential units some utilities and so forth and and then some amenities and just uh, um, you know um, you know back of the house uh, condominium needs like trash rooms and so forth and then once we go to the the second floor is it's um, we ha we have a you know our typical units that stack. We have two bedrooms, studios, um, and and then uh, at this point at least we were hoping to get some decks, although those are are gone now. But um, at the sec at the second floor level now we are the same level as the park, which is about ten to twelve feet above Hamden Street, um, and that's when we start having windows overlooking the park. Third floor it's. Uh, almost a uh, stack from the second floor. And then we go into the fourth and fifth floor where, where we have um, uh, just duplex units with, uh, with what I would like to call killer decks at all the, at, at the corners. Uh, and uh, um, I, I think this is where sort of the, the really um, beautiful and great units um, are gonna come out. Um, and th this is, uh, uh, a building section again, just uh, um, office space at the bottom and just residential on top. Um, in terms of of the wall section, this is something that that we that we're still working uh, or trying to uh, fine tune. But but it, it, this is we're, we're roughly looking at, at uh, you know just the. You know, CLT slabs, CLT on the exterior walls, and we're, we're looking to use um, uh, protocol armor wall to do most of our insulation and, and, and uh, air tightness uh, with, uh, with a corrugated metal uh, cladding. Um, so, okay. So, so moving on to, to some of the fun things that we've been sort of dealing with. Um, we originally, so, so the, when we started uh, asking the question of like, okay, what do we need to do to make a, a full, you know, what I call the full CLT building, um, we had some challenges. Uh, and I think that the main challenge was uh, um, the shear walls, the lateral loads, that, that's essentially, it's not allowed per code or it's a matter not provided for, which essentially means that the code does not mention it. It doesn't say that it's not allowed, but it just doesn't mention it. So, so, so it's that, that's sort of the, the first problem and that we essentially realized that we had to go ask for a variance. Uh, we were trying to do it at the local level with Boston, but Boston very quickly kicked, said, no, I think you, have to, you, you guys have to go to the state. So, so we know we knew we had to to go after after that variance, um, but then we we also knew that we had to probably go for another variance, 
and that depended on uh, depended on the building type that we chose. Um, we originally chose building type 3A, although it didn't make some sense because you know you have 4HT, which is directed for you know heavy timber. But um, there, there's some some things on the the 4H that didn't make a lot of sense. Like it, it asked actually for all the non-bearing partitions to be fire rated. So that didn't really add up to us. So so we we try we, we try to go with 3A first, uh, which meant that I mean in many ways the building could fit into the 3A category, uh, but we would have to ask for a variance on the ex exterior walls uh, because you, you're not allowed to have uh, in, um, combustible materials. So so we would we you know that that would be our ask from the state. Uh, and really, when we submitted to ISD and, and talked to um, to the Boston Fire Department, they kind of didn't like that idea. They said, you know what, I think this doesn't make a lot of sense. You guys should just resubmit and go for, uh, as 4-H. Um, so we, we, we you know, working with the code consultants and so forth, we, we looked at it. We said, okay, sure, I guess at the end of the day, this this makes a lot more sense. But we still had to go for another variance. So, uh, and in this case, would be concealed spaces. So you're not allowed to have concealed spaces. But our ask for this variance was to have a, a you know, that they would be limited in nature, um, which was in, in many ways key because, um, you know, when you think about having two route mechanical, electrical, all sorts of stuff, on on your ceiling plannings and when you're trying to expose it, you know, you, you, you can expose a good amount of it, but you're going to have to cover a good amount of, of, of that too. And, and, and just having essentially a, a drop drywall ceiling means that we have a concealed space. So we have, we have to ask for the, for the variance and we just kept that as limited. So we're just trying to minimize that as much as possible, but that, that was sort of a, a lot of learning, of course, and a learning curve here, just trying to go with the 3A first and then uh, being guided towards 4HT. And now I, uh, we, we submitted, um, this, the state was actually very, very encouraging. They were really excited about the project. And, uh, they couldn't sort of say more things about how they hope there'll be more projects like this. Um, I mean, I, and another piece I guess that I forgot to to talk about is that um, the CLT shear wall variance, like I said, it's a matter not provided for, but the 2020 edition it clearly actually allows it. So, so we made for a pretty easy, um, you know, argument, if you will. All right. So, so that that's that was one of the big um, learning curves. Then, then, then we went to vendors. <laughs> Um, so who is it going to help us? Who, we needed some help, although we we're working with Generate. Um, you know, th there's there's a point where where a vendor and the design assist becomes really important. Um, so these are, I think these are all the folks that we talked to, and, and they all came with with different sort of, you know, um, different attributes, I guess. Um, I think if you can see, we have we have some folks from from Europe, KLH, Binderholtz, and Storenzo. Um, I think they were all really great folks to work with. They were really very responsive. Uh, in particular, I, I liked work. I like KLH. Um, they're, they just seem to be ready to help us out, and you know, in many ways, it it, it made sense. But um, we we had gone also down the road with Nordic uh, to help us out with 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 uh, the project and sort of helping us with design assist and the detail and so forth. Um, and uh, that was you know that was all going in a, in a pretty good direction and we were sort of uh, happy and, and looking forward to to the whole process. Uh, and part of what they were gonna, th th what they would be helping us do is also they would help us optimize, um, you know, the, the the planks and the use of the material. Um, 
you know, another thing that we had per, perhaps not working for us is, is like I mentioned before, is the shape of the building. Uh, I think CLT would be better off with a sort of rectangular building, but we had everything but that. Um, so, so they, you know, they, part of what we were hoping to get out of this whole um, process was, you know, helping optimizing and, uh, you know, the structural systems. But anyway, so so this was this was another path that we were going down and that we, that just uh, essentially stopped at some point. Uh, and um, um, our development team applied for for a grant uh, and was uh, and we we we, we uh, were given the grant and the grant essentially uh, is to use. Um, Hemlock as, as the material for, for CLT, um, and uh, I, I think uh, that's no, that, that, that it's uh, super interesting, but also presents a, a number of challenges. And, and this is sort of like this is the path that that we're heading down at, at this point. Now, Hemlock is is pretty interesting for for a number of reasons. Um, I, I think. Uh, Mostly, uh, I think, uh, well, first of all, it, it has the potential to start up um, uh, an industry in the Northeast for, for CLT because it's, it, it, you know, it's a species that grows around here, but, but also because it, it's, it's also not uh, typically used for lumber because of, of, its, um, of, of its defects. So, so there is a potential there, and then I, and then there is there's a, a sort of a, it couples with another so not more of an issue that um, Hemlock's been having with with a uh, with an insect that is essentially you know killing the tree but actually not damaging the lumber. So so there there is there, there's uh, apparently there's a good amount of, of this material that 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 could be used and it could uh, potentially spark up uh, an, an industry. So um, as it as it currently stands with our project, we we are we're going down this path. Oh, it's the next slide. Okay, I think that's all I have. Uh, and and then we're going to be partnering up back to our to our vendors. We're going to be we're going to end up partnering up with Smartland. Uh, and that's because it's it's meant to be a sort of a, a, a U.S. Um, vendor that is going to be um, helping us with all with the testing because we we have to be testing this this product and and then also the milling of the product uh, and then delivery and so forth. So so this is where we stand right now. Uh, but uh, I I feel like at, at this point. There is no more big questions. Uh, actually, I think um, the Smart Lamb uh, partnership is almost uh, settled. So it's you know there's there's no more questions. So now we just need to sort of put our heads down and fin finish the, the project off. And um, our structural engineers are are ready to go and so forth. So I guess that that's the, that's a brief story uh, of of all the sort of trials and tribulations of hands and. <laughs> Uh, and where we are, and you know, th that's you know, here's just a, some of the renderings, uh, some of the sort of architectural expressions that we're trying to work with, and um, another view uh, of uh, some of those duplex units that you, you I showed you in the floor plans. Uh, oh, that's Travis Anderson, but thank you very much, uh, and I'm gonna be passing it on to Patrick now. <laughs> All right. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right. Rock and roll. Um, Andres, thank you so much for passing it off. And uh, as a great uh, view into your project, I'm, I'm so excited to see how that turns out. Uh, I know that uh, here at Haycon, we have a couple more CLT projects in the hopper, one of them being um, going to that stair elevator core with the with the CLT shear walls, um, so hope, hope you guys can you know make that happen and and that'll help us you know uh, push that through. Um, but anyways, big thank you to Travis um, for inviting me to uh, speak today. 
Um, I'll share my screen really quick and, and kick us off. Should have everything I need up. Present here. Can everyone still hear me? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, for some reason, it kicked out my presentation. One second. All right. Can you guys see my presentation? No reason I can't we saw get when it. you brought up the screen the first time and it disappeared when you hit present. Okay, so you guys can see my screen now. Yeah, we see your desktop. Yeah. Okay, I tried to hit present. Let me see. Maybe I got to go through a different mode here. Um, for some reason, I'm. Uh, I guess uh, I'm in a. A browser version of PowerPoint. I apologize. So it looks like it. I might have to present here. Can you guys see the the slide? Yeah. Well enough. Yeah. Okay. You'll that you'll get it. You'll have a nice preview of what's coming up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, all right, Eleven East Lennox. That is our project here at HakeCon. Um, so my name is Patrick Larkham. I'm as as um, Travis mentioned. I'm a project manager here. I started with a company. Uh, last summer, literally this time last summer, I was on site um, doing a bit of both, bit of, bit of field engineering, bit of site supervision, and just solving problems, kind of getting into into the company and and into you know this high performance building world, and and ultimately what we're headed towards, Lake Place Taylor, is <clears throat> the passive house um, realm and and passive building and and going for passive house certification for um this project 11 east lennox and all of our future projects so we're really excited for that uh i will say just like andrew sort of um up front i'm by no mean a specialist but hopefully i can share what i've learned along the way and what we continue to learn as we go uh i will point to all of our partners um that you hear see here on the slide and all the hard work that they've done to kind of get us to this point um Hakon is the gc uh, so we're we're sort of responsible for uh, building the project. Um, we do a lot of design build work ourselves, uh, but it's it's with big um, sort of partnership and collaboration with Monty French Design Studios. They're the architects, uh, and the many other partners here, especially H and O, uh, Hayes O'Neill. Uh, they're the engineering team, the structural engineering team that we've been working with here, and they're sort of I I, I believe uh, they've sort of introduce this idea of impossibility uh, of 11 East Lennox as a CLT uh, passive house project um, on the CLT side anyways. Uh, and then Passive to Positive uh, is a consulting firm for passive house building that we are working with. Um, and you know, as, as Anders mentioned, with the different options for CLT, uh, we are going with Nordic, Nordic structures. Um, it's been uh, a great partnership. Uh, I've actually gotten to work with them probably since last winter, uh, and we're now to the point where we've, uh, we're have we just ready to receive our um, submittal package for the whole CLT uh, design. Uh, so everything from all the CLT panels for each floor, the golem beams, the, the columns, um, and everything. So we're excited to kind of get our hands on that, dig into it, see if the uh, See if everything is going to come together. Um, Northeast Earthworks, our excavator, Boston Real Estate Collaborative is our uh, owner developer. Um, and then, you know, uh, in terms of variances and, and bringing CLT to market, I know uh, working on uh, the different variances for fire protection um, and others is sort of one of the big challenges. And so, Code Red, uh, our consultants that we've been working with um, on that side of things. So, uh, let's dive into it. Um, of course, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram. But uh, here's a quick overview of the project and uh, a nice rendering. You can see the CLT uh, uh, ceiling panels basically in, in the exterior of each unit uh, from the street here. But about the project, it's uh, multifamily. Um, 
passive house, we're going for uh, our FIA certification, uh, currently working through um, pre-certification, uh, making good strides there. Uh, it's about 37,000 square feet, uh, 34 units, and we do have some parking. It's a, a tight site as well, since it's right, um, right in sort of the lower Roxbury area. Uh, it's a couple blocks from Boston Medical Center. Center. It's, it's Lenox Street is right off of Washington Street. Um, so probably, a, a, what I, I don't know, maybe three to six blocks from Hamden Street. Uh, <clears throat> I'm familiar with it because I started at another project that we have going on in Nubian Square. So as I'm working on that future project, I'm going to be looking for the place there, the place to learn uh, policy there. Um, so we're, we're right in that Boston neighborhood as well. Um, but we'll have eight spaces um, in the uh, on the first floor. So there'll be no basement in this uh, in this building, but you can kind of see um, a mural uh, here on the ground floor with the garage door. Uh, so cars will exit from here. There'll be eight spaces in here, uh, a little amenity space, a co-working space uh, in the front here. Uh, back of house area will have sort of a trash room for uh, the buildings in the area. Um, this is one building of, I believe, two others uh, that our developers uh, owned on this plot of land. Um, and so it's a, it's a really cool project. Um, you know, in, in terms of Boston, it's, it's, uh, it's residential. So, you know, all apartments, all rentals, uh, we will have uh, a certain number of um, units uh, at lower cost, uh, affordable housing. Um, and what else we got? Uh, in terms of, you know, the CLT specific items, uh, you know, around 14 million for the project cost, timber cost, uh, around 2 million. Uh, and so that kind of put us for our framing, uh, for the CLT frame, which you'll see more of in detail on the future slides here, uh, about 13 to $15 more per square foot as compared to say a, a five over two podium frame building, which previous to this, uh, when I first started last summer, it was sort of our typical design build, multifamily residential. Um, there, there'll be a slide about 44 North Beacon, which is where I started, where it was a um, steel uh, concrete podium on the first floor with four floors above, uh, you know, typical timber construction. Um, so uh, Nordic is the manufacturer and they're partnering with Ergol uh, to construct the building, um, their shop out of Connecticut. Uh, and for the timber species, uh, they'll be using uh, black spruce uh, and jack pine, um, primarily black spruce, I believe. And carbon savings that we've sort of uh, estimated in our design process will be over a thousand metric tons of CO2, um, which is really, really interesting and exciting. I'm kind of learning more about this as we go. Um, that combined with the passive house elements to the design and to the building, um, yeah, definitely shows a lot of promise for the Boston area uh, and, and doing our best to, you know, uh, protect the environment. Um, so uh, with regards to code compliance, like Anders mentioned, um, definitely some variances we had to seek. Um, it's kind of a, a quick summary here on the right. A um, couple of them, you know, for this uh, in Boston, 70 feet. Uh, or higher, I believe, is a high-rise uh, requirement. So to stay under the high-rise level, uh, we kept it just under 70 feet, um, and and we're able to fit sort of seven floors under 70 feet. First floor is about eight to 10 feet, depending on what you're looking at, and then the floors above that are right around eight um, eight feet. Uh, so it gets a bit tricky fitting everything into the building with regards to systems, which uh, I'll kind of get into uh, shortly. Um, Definitely uh, some interesting things though, with regards to uh, fire protection um, as a type four you know, heavy timber building, um, the engineers and uh, Nordic have, have designed in a two inch char depth to the CLT, uh, which means you know the, the floor slab or the glowing beams and columns uh, will still be structurally sound, even if they burn up to two inches. Um, which is really, really cool. Um, and then, of course, like Anders mentioned, with the uh, concealed spaces uh, for us, we, we asked for a variance. Um, they will either be sprinklered or um, basically fire stop. So uh, GWB protected uh, drywall on all surfaces and stuff with mineral wool. 
Um, so I'm going to get into that a little bit uh, later. Um, we'll stick with that for now. If you guys have questions about any of this, definitely uh, let us know at the end. Uh, for us uh, at Haycon, working with our partners that I mentioned in the beginning, it's it's been a very collaborative, uh, integrated process, and that's kind of how we're approaching it. And uh, with regards to high performance building and and ultimately making this you know come to fruition, um, it definitely takes a village. It takes a team effort. So you know, step one. Um, We've kind of formed a, a team of manufacturers and vendors uh, that are willing to work with us on coordination. Um, we're actually getting into that tomorrow. Um, our main subs are, are coming to their first uh, coordination meeting with our BIM team um, to go through the model of the building and figure out um, you know, where everything's going to be located. Uh, and then uh, you know, that kind of that plus the integrated uh, design process with the architects, the structural engineers. Um, we work with BLW for our uh, trades for MEPs uh, and, you know, bringing our sort of core subs, our core vendors, design team, uh, specialists, both from Nordic as well as Passive House uh, consultants together. Um, we kind of made a big push over the last year uh, or two to, to kind of get to this point. Um, we did a, definitely did a cost analysis um, kind of conceive the structure, which we'll dive into uh, a little bit here shortly. Um, and then the, the consultant work with passive house eligibility is ongoing. Um, we've gotten our first review back. We're working on, on getting our second uh, uh, passive house package kind of submitted, um, answering questions they've kind of posed to us and, and uh, fixing uh, a couple of challenges, you know, here and there. Uh, and then um, ultimately, BIM coordination and virtual design. It's kind of what I've been delving into a bit more. I've hired um, uh, an assistant PM and a BIM coordinator. His name is Aaron Spiegel. He's great. Uh, and he's been able to basically build our building from the ground up per the design and create a virtual digital twin. Um, you know, using some of the 3D models that the design team have used, we're kind of consolidating that and bringing into a coordinated model where we can see all the systems uh, together and then help work with our subs to create construction drawings and ultimately um, bring it through. Just to check, is everyone still good? You guys all still hear me? Perfect. Awesome. Uh, so let's take a, a, a quick look here. Um, here is our structure. So this is the CLT um, and, and kind of what the building uh, will, the bones of the building will look like. So we got seven stories of Glellum post and beam. So uh, just like uh, Anders said, we'll have a concrete slab, a concrete foundation on the ground floor. And, but from there up, it'll all be uh, flallum beams, uh, columns, and uh, CLT floor slabs. Um, the concrete is going to be cast in place, slab on grade, and foundations. Uh, we're on this project, uh, we decided to use uh, a new newer system it's called ready for uh, it's made by bullcraft it's a uh, modular steel concrete form so they basically designed these steel uh, boxes for the stair core and elevator core they'll deliver them sort of almost floor by floor but in mods they'll stack them weld them place rebar that's already been uh, designed and then we'll fill that with concrete and the form the steel form will stay in place um, throughout the life of the building we're actually going to use that uh, those steel forms will be uh, exposed in the main quarters, so it kind of will give it a, a nice industrial feel with um, exposed CLT in the units, as well as exposed beams in the hallways. Um, we're utilizing a double beam scheme here, uh, sort of an interesting concept. You can kind of see at the end of each uh, cross beam here, there's actually two beams running side by side, and that allows us to uh, find space for the trades uh, in between. So we'll be running our trades and systems vertically through the building in almost quadrants through those double beams uh, and then stuffing the cavities with mineral wool for fire protection. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a really neat use of space. Um, in total, we only have 12 steel beams uh, and posts in, in this design. You can see them right here in the garage, basically two as you enter, a couple more um, inside. Uh, just essentially cross members to strengthen up the garage uh, on that first floor layer, but everything else ties right into both cores um, for structural uh, stability, which is pretty cool. Um, dive in a 
bit deeper, here's a, a couple of sections of the different systems on each floor. So you can kind of see the CLT floor panels and the double beams and how we'll be fitting um, all the MEPs uh, in here. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, it, it definitely is taking a bit of integrate, uh, integrated and coordinated design. Um, we're working with our actively with our subs and with the design team. Uh, um, it's got to be a stacked decentralized system. So, you know, in past buildings that we've done, uh, you know, we've had one large ERV on the roof uh, for ventilation and getting fresh air to all the units and all the all the common spaces. Uh, for this one, uh, for past uh, purposes, as well as I think it's going to work out well in in our time of COVID, uh, we'll actually have. Uh, individual ERVs in each unit for fresh air. Uh, and it kind of shortens the run of systems and designs. Uh, and then we're going to use a VRV fan coil units for heating and cooling uh, in each unit. And that'll be, um, you know, the variable refrigerant flow will run vertically to the roof and we'll have our heat pumps and condensers um, on the roof uh, for heating and cooling. Um, solar ray on the roof. Uh, as well. Um, I think I'll call that good. If, if, you, if anyone has questions about systems or anything like that, uh, I know our topic today is CLT, but uh, you know, we can always come back to any of these. Um, here's a nice sort of cross section of the building uh, where you can see each floor, the exposed uh, CLT beams, columns, floor slabs. Uh, there'll be uh, drop ceilings where that'll cover the ERB and ventilation and sort of ductwork uh, systems above each kitchen, sort of on the interior of the building. And then as you get to the exterior by the windows, there'll be nice um, exposed CLT ceilings. Uh, and just to give you guys, if anyone's wondering, like what does a, a three, five or nine ply piece of CLT look like? I actually have my computer resting on it. This is my uh, trusty sample from Nordic. Um, it's a five ply, so our floor slab is going to be a five ply uh, CLT uh, slab. So you can imagine, uh, you know, this will be the ceiling here. Um, but this will be essentially they come in about eight foot wide. Put my computer back up. They come in about eight foot wide by forty to fifty foot long, um, or thirty to forty foot long slabs, uh, stacked on a truck all the way down from Canada. Um, and then we'll lift them into place as we erect the building. Um, so really cool. It, it looks awesome. Um, we're going to try and protect it, keep it bare. Uh, we, we've sort of set up our systems uh, to allow for that. Um, with regards to CO2, um, you know, low carbon footprint, um, like uh, Travis mentioned in the beginning, we'll be using uh, European style um, triple pane high efficiency windows from Amberline. Um, and then, uh, you know, with the passive house aspect of this project, you know, when you combine the three different aspects there, super insulated uh, walls, we're using armor wall as well, um, uh, thermally broken. So every steel post that you sort of see here in the garage, um, well, actually not in the garage, our, our unique aspect of the project is that this garage is unconditioned, but we will have a conditioned plenum above the garage that will hold all of our plumbing uh, and get everything back to where it needs to go without freezing in New England. Um, but the posts uh, inside the amenity space will actually have uh, thermal, thermal breaks. Um, you know, if, if anyone's heard of Fabrica or Armatherm, uh, thermal, thermal breaks under each steel column or under each um, mass timber beam or mass timber column uh, to break uh, the heat transfer from you know, the cold ground to the cold foundation. Um, and then the third aspect that I was getting to is air tightness. That's going to be, I think, one of our, our biggest challenges. Uh, we do have the armor wall continuous insulation wrapped all the way around the building. So we'll have it sort of airtight from the outside. But, uh, you know, in, in my world, I'm, I'm starting to work with all of our subs to figure out how we can make sure we don't poke too many holes in places they're not supposed to be. We seal up our vapor bar our smart vapor barriers uh, cleanly and with good taping. Um, and have good air sealing details for all the windows, ventilation, uh, plumbing stacks, things like that. Um, so hopefully that is uh, helpful. Um, quick carbon summary. Uh, so with our building, we're looking at 
you know, about 950 cubic meters of wood products. Um, and, uh, you know, as Travis mentioned, US and Canada, you know, forest grow, you know, can, can grow this, this wood in three minutes, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, it sounds like Nordic has their own sort of forest to, to pull from, uh, which is great, and they, they maintain that. Uh, and um, carbon stored in wood, uh, 844 metric tons of carbon dioxide from you know, growth to uh, when it's harvested. Uh, and then, you know, avoiding greenhouse gases. I think um, that's a big part of the CLT draw um, is, is the, you know, the amount of carbon dioxide uh, that you can avoid using. Uh, and then you combine that with a passive house building, high performance building aspect. You can take a lot of the energy needs that a typical building of this size would draw from the grid uh, and cut that way down. Um, so couple of cool points. Uh, a couple other things for the design here. Uh, we'll be using uh, terracotta panels, uh, white terracotta panels on the front. Um, give it a nice, bright, sort of warm look, highlight the wood, uh, the wood, the CLT ceilings uh, and beams. And then, um, you know, I mentioned some of the challenges. We'll have uh, solar shades on the back side of the building to cut down, to bring our cooling loads down uh, and make sure we hit passive house certification. Uh, and then we'll also have balconies on the back and uh, how those balconies attach um, to the CLT slab uh, proven to be uh, a little bit of a challenge. Um, some of the most of the balconies will attach sort of at the end grain condition where it's tough to actually uh, fasten into and actually get the right amount of shear load. Uh, so we're working uh, with our balcony vendor to sort of come up with a design where we can anchor from both the top and the side um, to, to cover that shear, uh, that gravity load. Um, Just just to chime in quicker, we're we're about six minutes to six. Ah. I'll be cognizant of everyone's time. So, thank you. I will I will cut it short then. The, I, my last slide was going to be this. So on the right here is 44 North Beacon. That's where I started last summer. A uh, typical podium with uh, you know panelized walls and, and stick framing above it. And now we're you know pushing forward on uh, CLT Mass Timber for Lebanese East Lennox. Um, Let's maybe let's dive into questions. I, I think I've said enough. Uh, apologies, I like Anders. I, I like to talk. Um, hopefully that was helpful, though. That was great. Thanks, Andres. Thanks, Patrick. Um, there's one question in the chat from Nick asking about a uh, construction timeline uh, for CLT in comparison to you know standard steel or concrete building. I don't know if Patrick, if you have analysis on that, since you're kind of getting yeah, a little bit more. <clears throat> definitely. Um, that's that's actually, I think it's both a challenge and a takeaway. Um, you know, I think CLT could lend itself to potential longer lead times or uh, coordination logistics and issues. But if you get on that from the front end and you can work with the design team um, and your, your sort of subs and, and vendors, uh, heading into the project, you can, I think, speed up uh, the, the construction process. Right now, we're aiming to have our building erected um, by December and then uh, fighting to have it complete by next September, uh, September 2022. Um, so I think it's right on par with typical construction. Uh, in the end, it comes down to the details and the logistics and, and coordination. Um, I don't think it. I, you know, it, I definitely on the CLT front, it is faster because everything, once it's designed, everything comes pre-panelized, uh, pre-designed and ready to go. So if you have a good erection team, they'll essentially, you know, we'll be doing uh, for these seven floors, our plan right now is to do basically a floor a week. So, you know, a couple of days to get up the columns, a couple of days to get the beams, uh, and then picking the each floor slab and placing them um, sort of from one end of the building to the other. Uh, plywood splines, waterproof membrane to, to protect it. Um, that's that's what we have on the schedule at the moment. That's what we're fighting for. Uh, I can let you know how it goes. Uh, definitely follow, follow us on, on LinkedIn and social. You'll, you'll, you'll see us <laughs> as we go. Cool. Um, <clears throat> another, Patrick, also curious about your wall section that you're you're proposing for that um, since it's an yeah. infill, which is slightly different than the place Taylor version where it's all CLT. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Let's see if this has a decent view of it. Um, 
apologize, I don't have uh, any of the wall details on this on this slide deck. I think this is probably going to be the best for us. Um, from the outside in here, it'll be a cladding, you know, rain screen cladding uh, fixed to uh, two and three quarter inches of armor wall, which is basically a half inch of magnesium board plywood, and then uh, two inches and change of uh, you know, solid insulation. Um, that provides a structure for the rain screen, and that gets affixed right to uh, stick frame. We're gonna uh, just do standard FRT stick frame exterior walls. They're non-load bearing, so they'll be attached to the flexion tracks um, mm -hmm. at each floor because with the CLT mass timber building, it'll flex and grow kind of with the seasons and temperature changes and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, and in, in the stick frame walls, we'll have uh, mineral wool, uh, rock wool, um, and then a smart vapor barrier um, to allow for vapor, uh, appropriate vapor transfer, uh, and then drywall. Great. Uh, any other questions that anyone wants to put in the chat? I saw a few people kind of come in late to the presentation. Um, we did move the time, so hopefully everybody caught that. So apologies there. Uh, Nick is asking about carpentry unions on these projects um, with the bulk of carpentry and labor occurring off site. Uh, that's something that you know we talk about quite a bit too. Is you know, working with the labor unions as these projects go up in scale, the interest from them, any pushback people are experiencing or not. Definitely, we, we, uh, we went through a case study analysis on that um, and we were able to work with uh, the Carpenters Union to get some um, concessions or some, some market opportunity funds uh, to make it competitive. And so we actually, Aragal is a union shop from Connecticut, they'll be uh, erecting the structure and our exterior walls. Um, Nordic has, you know, does the manufacturing of the the slabs up in Canada and then ships it down. So, you know, there's that. Um, but we were able to bring the the carpenters union in for erection here, as well as uh, we're using marguerite uh, concrete for our foundation work as well. Um, yeah, it's gonna be really though, yeah. how this all this shakes out. Um, moving forward and kind of the idea with this, this would turn into a more of a series. So this could be, my thinking was this would be a sort of like the first round and we could watch these projects uh, develop and kind of check back in with them periodically throughout their process. Um, Cause I know it's, you know, it's of interest of a lot of people here in Boston and around the region. Um, I, would so, really Patrick, appreciate that. Um, I would encourage both you guys, we have a videographer, I think this would make a great documentary if you did short video check-ins, and then do like where you, you know, if we, if we did like four different check-ins, like where you're at with the design, where you're at with, you know, just, I think it'd be fascinating for people to follow this story, because you guys are really building the future of like, you know, low bar, low carbon buildings, so if you guys were open to it, we could have our videographer come out and do uh, some documentary, just interviewing you guys, like what are some of the challenges? And then when the building goes up, you know, and because, you know, you can get some very cool drone footage during the, what, when it's going up. And then just to tell this story so other people can sort of visualize and understand what they're getting into, you guys are breaking the ground. And that's what I'm so excited. It's like so cool that you guys are doing this. But the more you can tell the story and then, and people see the, the challenges you're running into with, with um, you know, variances, with uh, any union stuff, any of that stuff is an interesting story that we could bring to a, a larger audience. I think you guys are so in the weeds of it. I'm just like, you got to reach more, we could reach a lot of people with a short, you know, so if you're open to it, uh, we have a videographer who can come out and meet with you guys and film it. And then we can to document what you guys are doing. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, because the biggest challenge right now is all these hurdles that Andres and Patrick are talking about, the zoning variances that we have to go through, hopefully that'll become easier. And you know, the more we can put lessons learned out there, it'll make it easier for other project teams to do this. Cause you know, ideally it's not just two companies and or three companies in Boston that are doing these things, right? Ideally everyone starts to move down this path. And you know, we see it from the passive house perspective too it does make it a little bit easier to achieve that, um, that level of you know, performance uh, just by incorporating the, the heavy timber, um, which is great. You, you come on ahead 
right from the beginning with, in terms of carbon, which is pretty amazing. All right. Uh, if there's no more questions, I would like to thank everybody. Thank the studio. Uh, thanks to Aaron for setting up the Zoom and everything. And um, keep an eye out for uh, future presentations and in, in video snippets in the, uh, in the near term. So thanks again.